Thank you so much for joining us for this Facebook Live with Mayor Southers. Mayor, thanks for being here. Uh, Jen, I'm glad to do it. Um, and I think basically we want to start by thanking all of <coughs> you uh, for joining us on this Valentine's Day lunch hour. And we're so grateful for the love you show this city um, every day. And um, it is evidenced by some of these questions that we've received. We've received several uh, great questions. We're going to try to get to as many as we can in this half hour, um, and we'll just get started. If we don't get to all of them, we want to remind you we're going to do this again real soon so we can get to more. Um, let's start with Banning Lewis Ranch, Mayor, and talking about um, some of the issues surrounding that. We have a specific question from Adrian on Facebook direct message uh, that reads, can you explain how developing Banning Lewis Ranch will help the city? Yeah, we need to uh, start with a little history here, Jen. Okay. It goes back to 1988 when it was initially annexed into the city. The developer was a guy by the name of Frank Aries. And he came to the city and had grandiose plans. He was going to 250,000 people in the Banning Lewis area. He wanted to hard, hard zone the whole thing. Uh, we we're going to have six lane highways and all this kind of stuff. And the city said, okay. Uh, Frank Aries, uh, uh, in hindsight, probably had no intention of developing the property. He wound up uh, fleeing to Belize some years later, leaving the banks high and dry. And since that time, we've had a series of people take ownership of Banning Lewis Ranch, uh, but under the annexation agreement that exists, it's uneconomical to develop. Uh, it needs to be developed uh, in smaller chunks. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, uh, what they're now talking about is that total build out would be 180,000 instead of 250,000. But they're really looking at let's do a third at a time and then, you know, let's move forward. Um, so, what we're trying to do is enter into an amended annexation agreement that makes sure that it's a high quality of life for the people that work, that live out there. Number two pays for itself, that developers are paying for infrastructure, uh, we're uh, producing enough revenue to pay for streets and all that sort of thing, uh, but uh, can be done. Because here's the problem, because it's been un uneconomical to develop, the city's lost uh, an estimated $4 billion in economic development uh, over the, the ensuing years, uh, several thousand jobs. And most importantly, development has leapfrogged it. It's not like we prevented urban sprawl, we exacerbated it. Mm -hmm. Because development went beyond the city boundaries out to Falcon and is now moving you know, towards Peyton and Calhan, and this has now become an infill area. Uh, other than Banning Lewis Ranch, there's only 6,000 undeveloped acres uh, in the city limits. Uh, if we don't develop this, not only are we not, were we losing out on an awful lot of economic development, uh, and, it, and it winds up being you know, more, more urban sprawl in the counties, uh, uh, but um, uh, we'll, uh, I, I, the, the consequence will be very severe for, uh, for the city from an uh, economic uh, standpoint. We'll run out of any developmental area and housing costs you know, we're all talking about affordable housing. Mm -hmm. uh, housing costs will skyrocket. We mm -hmm. need uh, to provide housing for the people moving to Colorado Springs, and we need to do it in the city of Colorado Springs. Will be combined commercial and residential, and will you know uh, help the, the sales tax base and, and all those sorts of things. Uh, it needs to happen, and it needs to happen pretty quickly because Colorado Springs is rapidly run, running out of any room to grow. And we want this growth to take place in the city and not urban sprawl going all the way to Peyton or Callahan. Right. And we should mention, too, there have been some town hall uh, meetings to educate the public about this and receive input. But there's also on our website, coloradosprings.gov slash BLR, if people are interested in learning out. Uh, learning absolutely. Out there's a, a public hearings process mm -hmm. um, and there's an economic study that's available on the uh, I think the city website and things like that. Okay, if people are just learning about it. Let's move on to public safety. Our next question is from Kyle on Instagram. He asked Mayor Southers, what are your future plans for hiring more police and fire personnel? Are you going to allocate more funds to these assets, such as more police fire academies, new equipment for them, vehicles, fire engines, trucks, etc.? Uh, great question. And uh, as a result, and we have to thank the citizens of Colorado Springs for this, as a result of the citizens stepping up and approving stormwater fees. As you know, the city's had a lot of legal problems sur surrounding uh, stormwater, 
And if we did not get a dedicated revenue stream to pay for that, we were going to have to wind up paying, you know, twenty million dollars a year for stormwater out of general fund, which you're supposed to be using for police, fire, and things like that. So as a result of two A passing and us uh, having a dedicated revenue stream to pay for uh, stormwater infrastructure, we freed up money from the general fund. And here's how it's going to work. We are going to, the optimal class for the police academy is 48 uh, officers per class. We are going to run uh, 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 police academies of 48 every eight months until we've added 120 officers. We estimate, of course, it's depending upon the amount of attrition because roughly half of each class will be attrition and the other half will be new officers. Okay. If there's more attrition, then less of them are new officers. We estimate it will take us about four years to add those 120 officers. We don't want to add them any more quickly because uh, we you got to have the quality control. Mm -hmm. You have to have the recruiting. Uh, from the training standpoint, 48 is the optimal number. But we're going to run academy every uh, eight months until we've added 120 officers. Uh, the reason why we need more officers is number one, our response times are longer than they need to do, uh, need to be. And as a result, we've been taking people off some special assignments like gang units and things like that, putting them on uh, patrol uh, to make sure our uh, response times don't deteriorate you know, much more than they, they have. Uh, we'll be able to uh, man these specialized units and get enough uh, patrol officers on the street. It's something we've desperately needed to do. And I really thank the, the citizens of Colorado Springs for allowing us to do it. And how about um, specifically the equipment? Fire engines, trucks, some of that will be allocated by the departments? Yeah, the, 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 uh, the fire uh, department uh, has a replacement uh, program uh, that, uh, in my opinion, uh, I think you might have some firefighters that think it needs to be accelerated. Their equipment's pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we've uh, acquired uh, some major uh, uh, apparatus in the last uh, couple of years uh, the, we don't want to have anything older than 17 years. We want to make sure we keep up with uh, technology. Uh, police fleet uh, has, uh, is older than it should be, but this year we've allocated an extra 1.1 million over and above the million that we are going to spend uh, with the notion of uh, getting us much closer to where we should be in terms of the age of the uh, police fleet. Okay. Uh, moving on to marijuana. Next question is from Susan on Twitter. Where is all the pot money going to? It sure isn't fixing our roads. Uh, no, it's not. And let's, uh, you know, I think we need to talk about the state and then we need to talk about uh, Colorado Springs. Right. On a state level, um, you know, if we take in $150, $170 million in tax this year on a, on a state level from marijuana, the vast majority of that is going to go in to pay for the cost of regulating. Uh, marijuana. Uh, we have a marijuana regulatory division in the Department of Revenue and uh, that's expensive to have a lot of employees uh, uh, regulating the marijuana industry. Then we, uh, a lot of the, any of the excess money, uh, um, a lot of it has to go to, the, the governor's been very concerned about the black market. Uh, we now have a black market. Many estimate that more marijuana is being grown in the black market than in the regula regulated market. Uh, that undermines the regulated market. Uh, so there's millions of dollars, I think the hope of $20 million this year will be spent uh, trying to fight uh, the black market. Uh, then of course you've got, uh, there's a notion, and I happen to believe it, that uh, marijuana has contributed to the homelessness problem in, in Colorado. You know, the only thing that's changed in the last five years in Colorado is marijuana that would, to me, explain uh, the increase in homelessness uh, that we have in Colorado. I think an element of it, not all of it, is attracted for uh, the access uh, to marijuana. So there's some money that the states put into that. Uh, then by constitutional dictate, uh, uh, if there's money left over, up to 40 million has to go to education. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, it hasn't reached any of the urban school districts. It's been gone to rural school districts for construction and things like that. Uh, there, the bottom line, and obviously I, uh, I'm not a big fan of uh, legalized marijuana, we are not going to pay for essential government services with marijuana revenue. 
first of all, would be a very unpredictable uh, mm -hmm. revenue. Who knows what the federal government's going to do? That's obviously in limbo in terms of the Department of Justice attitude towards enforcing federal law, because everything mm -hmm. we're doing in Colorado is in violation of federal law. Um, so there's a certain uncertainty there. Uh, plus, um, uh, well, I'll just sum it up by saying Andrew Friedman, who was the first what we call marijuana czar in Colorado, uh, in his parting statement said, it's a huge myth if you think that marijuana revenue is going to pay for, uh, you know, uh, all our teachers and our roads and all that basic kind of stuff. Basic infrastructure. It's basically going to pay for uh, regulation and uh, some of the problems that it's uh, uh, created. Now in Colorado Springs, we don't have recreational marijuana. We've got uh, medicinal and the only revenue from that is the same sales tax that you pay if you buy a tie right. or something like that. And I think it's around $3 million a year. It goes into the general fund. Uh, some portion of that will get to, uh, to roads or some portion of it will get to you know, paying for police or something like that. But it's not a major source of revenue. Not a substantial amount. Yeah. Okay. Moving on to parks funding. Um, we have from Richard on Twitter, thank you, Mayor, for proactively seeking additional revenue to enhance quality of life in COS. Um, he uses the examples of Tusi and Stormwater and asks, will you use your influence to see additional revenue to improve parks, open spaces, trails in the city? You've got a yes vote here. Uh, yes. Uh, here, here's the issue with uh, uh, parks for the most part. Um, we still have not gotten to... to, to to general fund parks funding at levels we had before the recession. Right. Now, there is a lot of parks funding that doesn't come through the general fund, a lot of grants and things mm -hmm. like that. But most of your uh, maintenance and things like that either comes from the general fund or comes from uh, the trails and open space tax, mm -hmm. which is uh, one tenth of one percent. Um, uh, there's, we clearly have a lot of parks maintenance needs that uh, need to be met, haven't been met. I think we can do it uh, through uh, growth and revenue and some other ways in a, besides raising the, the TOPS tax. There may be, you know, at some point somebody may uh, want to go to the voters with an addition to the TOPS tax. We certainly need to renew it. But let me, uh, this year we came up with an additional 900000 for parks and we did it out of the increased revenue from the cable franchise fee. Next year, uh, there's going to be another million dollars in additional revenue from the cable franchise fee. And I think it's very appropriate that that money be expended in a way that benefits all the citizens. So I think this year we've spent an extra million. Next year we'll spend an extra million. Uh, I also think um, uh, down the road, you know, our lodging and rental tax proceeds go to promotion of, of tourism. And there's a couple of our parks that are major components of tourism, uh, particularly Garden of the Gods. And I think we can look to spend uh, some of those lodging and rental tax dollars, which have to go to tourism, for some improvement to, to Garden of the Gods, or maybe Cheyenne Canyon, which is also a, uh, a tourist attraction mm -hmm. that attracts other folks. Uh, so my goal in the next several years is to substantially uh, increase uh, uh, parks funding uh, within the revenue streams we have, and then we'll take a look at uh, whether we're making the kind of progress we need to make. Okay. Um, and I think we're, we're getting close on time, but um, anything else you want to add? I know you get a lot of questions in person in addition to... Uh, yeah, let me honor. just make a comment about the, uh, uh, down, you know, the one component of the City for Champions. There was four components of it. Three of them are moving forward. The Olympic Museum, the Sports Medicine Complex, uh, and uh, the uh, visitor center at the Air Force Academy. Mm -hmm. The one that's been problematic is the, um, and I want to make sure everybody understands, it's not just a downtown stadium. We have to build a stadium and an indoor sports center. Okay. Uh, there's 27.9 million of funding that comes through the state sales tax increment financing over 30 years. So if you, that only bonds about 15 million currently. Well, if you build a stadium at uh, 20 to 25 million, you build an indoor arena at 30 to 35 million, uh, that 15 doesn't go very far. Uh, so we're looking, uh, even with, you know, projected uh, cash flow from events, we came up about $28 million short. Uh, I don't think there's any appetite for this being paid for by 
uh, local uh, you know, general fund or anything like that. So we are working very, very hard to come up with you know, investment uh, that would allow us to do this. It's very complicated. We've got till the end of the year to make substantial progress to keep that, uh, that portion of the revenue. The others are going to go ahead no matter what. I hope to be able to pull this off, but it's very complicated. Okay. And I, we have time for one more question. I have one uh, from Hillary on Instagram regarding public transportation. She's asking, are there any plans to incorporate more widespread accessible public transportation? Uh, yes, but it, it has to be uh, largely uh, demand driven. Um, in Colorado Springs, and this sounds strange to say, but it's pretty cheap to park downtown. We don't have a bunch of folks saying, oh, it's too expensive to to park downtown, I'll take a bus. Um, and while we think sometimes our traffic's bad, it's not very bad in comparison to a lot of uh, urban areas, so people aren't deterred mm -hmm. you know, from getting on the interstate uh, and, and being driven towards uh, our uh, mass transportation system, uh, Pikes Peak uh, uh, Mountain Metro. 60% uh, of our riders are people going to work that have to go to work and 40% are have to go to school. Okay. We don't have a lot of discretionary riders. I think as we have more urbanization, more people will say, you know, I want the convenience of riding and then there'll be greater demand. As it is right now, we're monitoring, trying to determine routes that meet demand. People need to get to hospitals, people need to get to job sites, things like that. We have added uh, quite a few routes in the last couple of years, more importantly, uh, we have also contributed to the frequency. You know, where we were only every hour or only half hour or an hour every 15 minutes. Uh, and we're, con uh, you know, Mountain Metro Transit will continue to monitor that and within, uh, with the available resources brought from, you know, uh, PPRTA, 10% goes to fund Mountain Metro. The city has a um, maintenance of effort of $7 million. In the recession, we weren't anywhere near that. We're now meeting our obligations for maintenance of effort. We've actually increased the investment over the last couple of years, and that's resulted in more routes, and we hope to continue that over the next several years. And I know they've put some new technology on the buses as well, so folks can you know look at an app, know when it's coming. That's exactly you know, right. Not be standing out in the cold. I mean, those little things are also make our current transportation system more uh, That's right, uh, and, more there'll be, and there'll be more technology as the years go by. Uh, but uh, I am convinced that as Colorado Springs continues to urbanize, there'll be more and more demand uh, for uh, mass transit and uh, we'll respond to the demand. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us. We I'm glad to do it, it and hope to do it again. Yes. Uh, I was just going to mention that too. We hope to have another Facebook Live shortly. So we do encourage you when we put the call out again to please sub keep submitting these great questions. Um, we're on social media on Facebook. Twitter and Instagram, so please follow us and let us know what you would like for us to discuss next. Thanks so much for joining us.